Here at Koto, um, my name is Gronje Moss. I'm the Chief Executive um, and Secretary for Regulation at the Ministry for Regulation. Um, I see we have about 130 people online at the moment, so thank you very much for joining us. Um, I will start with a karakia. It's a very popular, well-known karakia, but for those of you who are based in Wellington, it is incredibly appropriate for today um, because it is incredibly windy, but also incredibly sunny. So. So again, thank you all for joining us. Um, Karakia does talk about the winds, uh, but the promise of a glorious day. Um, we do have a glorious day in Wellington, and I'm really excited um, to be able to host um, such an esteemed lineup of experts from um, around the world. So I'm really pleased to be joined today by Dr. Grant Pink, uh, by Julie Hind, and by His Excellency Lawrence Meredith. Um, so Grant um, is a leading expert in um, regulatory practice, um, over 30 years of experience. Um, he has worked closely with a number of jurisdictions and we're delighted that he's actually in New Zealand today. He's usually based in Australia, but he's in New Zealand today joining us for this event. Um, Julie uh, works on negotiating and implementing international regulatory cooperation and best practice uh, occupational regulation. Um, is based at MB. Um, MB is one of our largest agencies and actually manages uh, probably the most regulatory systems of any organisation, um, over 17 regulatory systems. Um, and His Excellency Lawrence Meredith, um, delighted to be joined by him today, has served as the Ambassador to New Zealand since the 1st of February, and has worked for the European Commission for over 25 years, focusing on economic development and cooperation, um, with a particular interest in um, nations and working alongside nations formerly part of the Soviet Union. Um, so, again, absolutely thrilled to have um, such a diverse and experienced uh, team here with me today. So, less from me and more from our esteemed panel. Um, so, I thought I'd start with, with you, Grant, because I do know that you travel a lot um, and you get to speak firsthand with a number of regulators and regulated parties. Um, you know, what are you noticing in terms of recent emerging trends in the world of, of regulation? Well, thank you very much, uh, Gronya. Thanks for the invitation. Thanks for the opportunity to be here. Um, when you introduced me as a leading expert, I think I'm only going to let people down. I would have <laughs> much heard you say Grant knows enough to be dangerous and then people would be impressed instead of disappointed. Um, <laughs> Yeah, you're right. I do, I do get to spend a lot of time with regulators at local, state, federal level in Australia, both levels here in New Zealand, and a range of international regulators. And I think the fundamental thing that I find myself saying is we have so much more in common than we have differences. So I, I think we should you know, try to embrace that instead of uh, reinventing the wheel. Um, of course, you are the Ministry for Regulation here in New Zealand. Uh, the counterpart that I work with is ANZOG, the Australian New Zealand School of Government, which is looking at um, the National Regulators Community of Practice. And if we had to say your UK cousin would be the Institute of Regulation. And the reason why I connect those dots is because it was only in March this year I was in London at the Institute of Regulation and we were talking on a very, very similar topic around international trends, better standards and what was that. So that's why I've been able to remine and reuse my notes. So if I gave you the, the high points, um, of course, there's AI and digital, which no doubt we will talk about. But in, when I was in London, I talked about Australia, I talked about New Zealand and I talked about the UK. And of course, there's the increasing importance of data and insights and intelligence. But also, I think regulatory capability and capacity, that's the big groundswell that I'm seeing is agencies are focusing on regulatory capability and capacity at a system wide broader than they ever have before, which I think fits perfectly for the regulatory stewardship um, aspect. But in terms of the headline article, I'll, I'll treat this like a movie trailer. I think in Australia, it's much more focused on regulatory outcomes. Uh, in New Zealand, of course, it's about regulatory stewardship. And in the UK, it was about um, uh, 
outcomes and cooperative based regulation. They were the three themes, which I'm sure I'll unpack when we have more discussion, dialogue and questions, but that would be the three themes. But of course, to my earlier comment, they're blending into what is regulatory capacity and capability? What is it for the individual? What is it for a function, a regulatory function? And what is it for a whole of system or ecosystem? So they would be my opening comments. Thanks very much, Grant. Very um, insightful, good food for thought there. I like the way you've kind of broken it down, both by country in terms of key points, but actually system-wide, but also for the practitioner as well. And obviously those emerging uh, new changes such as AI and how do we make the most of you know, digital data and insights. Uh, so, Julie, um, you get to interact you know, across the globe. Um, I sometimes get to go to Lower Hutt, so um, I'm really looking forward to hearing what uh, what uh, what what have, what have been the insights that you've uh, seen in terms of emerging trends in the work that you're doing in regul in the regulatory space. I mean, the the things that I think are um, frequent themes are a focus on how to regulate in an agile way. Like everybody's very conscious that with technology changing so quickly. Um, that the way we've regulated in the past, where we've kind of been quite prescriptive, hasn't isn't really fit for purpose anymore. And it's how do you design regulation in a way that's able to to kind of cope with change without needing to be revisited on a on a kind of ongoing basis? Now I know sort of principles based regulation is seen as one way to deal with that, but there are challenges with that too. So I think there's a bit of focus on that. A focus on obviously how do you regulate, you know, the digital AI environment. Also using digital tools to improve um, the sort of good regulatory practices around regulatory design. There's a little bit of a focus on that, but I guess the main thing for me, which I'm always looking for opportunities to promote, is the thinking around international regulatory cooperation, which is thinking about when you're designing or implementing any form of regulation. So this is for policy people and for regulators, thinking about the impl international implications of what you're doing. You know, we can't, we don't, we're not able to regulate on a solely domestic territorial basis anymore. If we want to encourage trade, movement of people, we need to make sure that our regulation isn't a barrier to that. But equally, if we're promising to deliver a policy objective, we need to be conscious that there are actors outside the domestic territory of New Zealand that might be impacting our regime and we need to think about how we can cooperate with other jurisdictions some way to kind of just make sure that we can actually make our regulation effective so I think there's a lot of things going on but I mean I would I would say and I've said this jokingly before if whatever the regulatory question IRC or international regulatory cooperation is clearly part of the answer so yeah for me that's a big one. Oh, thanks, Julie. Well, I think that leads us very well into our next panelist, actually, because that international regulation, you know, that cooperation you talk about, and interesting, I, I was meeting yesterday with, you know, New Zealand's largest company in terms of Fonterra, and actually that's exactly what they talked about. They said, you know, we are very mindful of what we require to actually trade elsewhere. And, you know, please don't forget that. Um, as you say, it's not about just domestic actors. So going to somebody who knows a lot about the actors um, elsewhere across the globe, Lawrence, I mean, what are you seeing in terms of emerging trends? What's on the top of mind in terms of the, you know, the countries making up the European Union when it comes to regulation? Well, <clears throat> fantastic. Thanks so much for this opportunity. Um, actually, uh, it's, it's really important because uh, I'm going to say a, a short um, anecdote when I went to the first business round table I'd only been in the country 10 days one of the businessmen around the table said oh well the European Union's main export is regulation and I'm like that's interesting um, uh, which helped me situate where I am and understand better some perceptions of the European Union um, and my reply was actually well we do have a single market of 450 million people so so we do have a few rules but I mean regulation is not a bad thing uh, the question is um, it's got to be proportionate and it's got to be easy to navigate and um, uh, I, I, I really think it's exciting what you're doing here in New Zealand um, but I also want to say that 
uh, with President von der Leyen putting a new team in place, she's um, very, very well aware of that type of feedback that I got. And she's appointed a vice president for simplification um, and tasked each commissioner with cutting red tape. So, I mean, it's a, it's, it's a part of the international effort is to make sure that our regulations, which we need, whether it's for regulating trade or the, ensuring a level playing field for companies across a large single market or for environmental standards, um, but that we get them right, that we get them proportionate. Um, and I think it's really exciting to have the opportunity to be part of this dialogue. You asked me about trends. I mean, I think um, the two that I would, um, well, I'd pick on three. Firstly, obviously, the European Union is globally leading on climate. This is really, really important, um, but it's also really important we get it right. Uh, we don't want excessive bureaucracy for, for farmers, for companies, for individuals, but we do want to protect the planet. So that's one. The second one, um, I have the impression that uh, the EU was the, the, the first bravest to go into the space of regulating AI with the AI Act. And um, I think everybody's watching that. I'm sure um, we've got some things right. As with any innovative legislation, we've probably got some things wrong as well. Uh, so everybody wants to see how we road test the AI Act. And of course, the, the big piece, which is I'm sure what's motivating many of you is also, um, you know, we've had 70 years of the European Union, we've got an awful lot of rules. So uh, this vice president's task with reviewing the whole lot and trying to simplify it. Um, we're, uh, good luck with that for uh, Mr. Dombrovskis, but it's very much a, a mission that's similar to yours. And I think it's really, really interesting to have this conversation. I'm sure he'd be very excited and his team to be in touch to discuss what's working well here in New Zealand and what we can learn from. Thank you. Yeah, look, thanks. Thanks very much. I think, um, you know, I, suppose I do I do want to acknowledge the kind of history, you know, even we're finding in our work in the Ministry for Regulation, you talked about 70 years of uh, the EU, so 70 years of rules. I mean, um, one of the challenges, I think, in terms of your point, um, I think, Julie, in terms of keeping regulation agile is some of it is driven from primary legislation and actually getting the time to actually, you know, get that through the house and get it changed in New Zealand is definitely a bit of a challenge. You know, we have a number of very, very old statutes um, and, you know, old acts that um, in the changing world are not kind of fit for a purpose. Um, so Grant, in terms of you've talked about some of the, the things that, that you're seeing and, and that AI and digital, um, have you been keeping an eye on the European Union's Act in terms of how they're thinking of uh, regulating? No, not, not the Act um, specifically, but I, I'm always impressed. I've, I've said this before, you could search the archives. If I could smash two countries together, it would be New Zealand and the Netherlands. I think their approach <laughs> to regulation is just fantastic. And I think it's because they're small enough that they can trial things um, and they've got you know good sense of humour. They're quite humble. Um, so I think, yeah, I, I take the best out of those two countries. And then I do look at the EU. I think, well, you've got 30 countries. So how do you level that playing field as to what Lawrence said before? But then understanding their nation states and how does a nation state give effect to that when it shares a border with two or three different countries? So it's where it's same, same and homogenous and where there needs to be differences for good and proper um, reason. So yeah, I, I quite often do go to the EU for examples of how things are done. And I'll, I'll give this uh, this uh, question uh, or, or a question framed as a comment. I'm not sure yet, Lawrence, um, because when I work with uh, clients, they'll say, oh, look at this, this shiny thing. Look at this wonderful thing that they have in the EU. And I say, well, we can't have that here in Australia or New Zealand because there's a whole water directive which gives effect to that shiny thing. So sometimes regulators will look for the, the shiny, innovative thing and want it, but not have the discipline, the rigour to have everything which goes around it. So that's probably a, a comment I'd like to sort of hear from you at some stage about, you know, those broader frameworks, but then how they're given to be operationalised where the rubber hits the road. But that's a question for Lawrence. That was probably unfair. Could I riff off and go back? Because I've just already, I've already got a page of notes, Ronya. So certainly can, certainly can. If I quickly play that back, I mean, uh, Julie, you were talking about uh, regulating in an agile way. I think there's a really useful framing around AAA or regulators being anticipatory, agile and adaptive. And to that end, you don't always have to look to um, the EU or Australia. 
Um, I've written an article with uh, New Zealand's own Rob Warner, which I can send the link to MFR to put on there. It's only 900 words and it talks a little bit about those three aspects. Um, and I think you're absolutely right about international cooperation. One plus one plus one equals five plus. We have to learn from each other. We have to learn um, how things have gone before. And also there was a comment, I think, about the, the poly, um, sorry, actually to connect that, I would say, um, I don't know who, who made the comment, whether it was Julie or, or Lawrence about policy folk and the operational. I think a document came out recently in July in Australia. It's, a, it's got too many Ps. Regulatory policy, practice and performance framework. And I think what that really, really usefully does, it makes a comment and says, this is important for, for those people involved in regulatory policy. And on the same point, this is important for people who are doing regulatory operations. So I think we need to stop that us and them, not the policy people thought and the and the operational people did. Um, that's part of closing that loop and, and continuous improvement. So working together. So I fully support that. And again, absolutely, Lawrence, regulation is not a bad thing. Um, it's been put in to protect people from, from being injured and, and, and their rights and protections. Um, my, my problem is when sometimes it's seen through a red tape reduction lens, they forget about the other part of it. So I think the important part when we have that red tape reduction conversation is we say, yes, it's about reducing, um, it's about stock flow and effectiveness. So reduce the stock of the stuff we're not using, replace it with good stock, which is fit for purpose and has been costed, but then don't forget about the effectiveness, which is the implementation the operational part that regulators do. So moving it beyond the economic and theoretical to, to regulatory practice, which I think sits at the heart of what the ministry is now interested in when it's looking at regulator performance. Um, and again, to your point about going early with AI and getting some things right and some things wrong, but at least you've started. And again, I would refer to some New, some New Zealand literature. I think it's a policy quarterly many years ago, Peter Mumford wrote, that all regulation is an experiment to some extent. You know, we had a policy, we had an idea, we tried something, did it work? So I don't know where I'm at in, in relation to answering your question or posing questions to other panellists, but that's my summary. Perhaps I'll be quiet for a little while now, Gronya. Yeah. Um, don't know, um, Julie, would you like to respond to any of that? And then maybe we'll hand over to Lawrence. Um, the, the sort of comment I would make, it's, um, the problem with New Zealand is because we're so small, if you're thinking about the sort of international regulatory cooperation and where you want to make sure that you're not different from where the rest of the world is tracking in order to reduce barriers or whatever, I'm very conscious that the EU is the sort of standard setter, as it were, and often we end up being a you know standards taker. So what the EU, how the EU regulates does have a kind of a ripple effect across across the rest of us. So I guess we're kind of always interested in what the EU EU is doing. It's just um, how we uh, can all kind of have some say ultimately, which is probably through, you know, different fora maybe for some of these kind of very important issues. We need to have a kind of dialogue involving all of the different interested countries across the world. But some of those conversations probably don't happen fast enough sometimes to actually keep our regulation up to date. It's a there's a tricky issue there about how we can all work together on, on a kind of a an aligned solution, but do it quickly in order to respond to these things that are coming down the pipe at us quite fast now. Yeah, thanks for that, Julie. Lawrence? Yeah, no, uh, fascinating exchange. I think that an important point to make about the European Union is what Grant said. It's it's 27 countries acting together, but also don't forget these countries individually do their own regulation on the vast majority of areas they regulate themselves. And then it's really important to understand that um, half the countries of the European Union are actually equal in size or smaller in population than New Zealand, contrary to popular belief. So people present the EU as this huge place. Uh, but as you know, a good old Ireland's identical in population. And, um, you know, Estonia is globally leading on digitalization. So Estonia, one of the EU member states, has some really interesting practice, feedback loops. Uh, you know, you can do a hell of a lot of stuff, in fact, pretty much everything online in Estonia. And that's only one of the 27. So we try and take the best practice from our member states. But when we aggregate it, of course, it gets quite challenging. Uh, to do what's happening in Estonia in a market of 450 million people. Um, so I think it's uh, that's why conversations with other um, 
polities uh, like New Zealand is really interesting. And I, I, I like the comparison with the Netherlands, but I think there's a bunch of other things. I think the Baltic states, the Nordics, Ireland, um, that, that's all interesting comparators for, for the New Zealand conversation, in my, in my view. Mm. Um, so one of the things that we haven't maybe touched on as much, I mean, are you seeing, you know, the, you have the, the regulated party and you have kind of stakeholders. Um, I think, you know, you've touched on a little bit, um, Lawrence, in terms of, um, you know, really important in terms of um, the protection of the planet. You know, that's a very high priority um, in terms of uh, the, 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 uh, the global work on climate that the EU is focusing on. Um, what are you hearing, you know, Grant and Julie, um, from the kind of regulated parties and stakeholders who are kind of partially in the, in the regulatory system, but but um, not not quite maybe one of the policymakers or one of the operational? What what are you you hearing from them in terms of where they want regulators to develop that capability and capacity? What do they think the pressures are on those? Um, where the, where do they want the regulators to be putting their priority? Shall I throw that to you, Grant, for, for some first thoughts? I was, I was going to practice that other skill of listening, but uh, yeah, happy to go, happy to go <laughs> first. Um, I think it's a very, very tricky issue because I talk about the four key regulatory perspectives. So if you can imagine a two by two, I, I, I talk about the regulator top left, I talk about the regulator top right, then the wider community bottom right, and then stakeholders bottom left. So. You know, clearly the regulator is the regulator. That includes their co-regulators that they work with, regulator to regulated parties, regulated entities, wider community speaks for itself. Whereas a stakeholder might be part of the wider community, but also regulated themselves, but be a stakeholder part of a peak body. So yeah. I think the first thing when we have a conversation is, can I just be clear what hat you're wearing and what voice you're speaking with on the issue? That's the first part. And then the second part, across the regulatory continuum, are we talking about regulatory regime design at one end or regulator performance at the other? Or are we talking more about the operational touch points that the user experiences? Is it part of the initial advice and guidance? Is it part of the licensing and approvals process? Is it part of monitoring compliance? Or is it part of enforcement? So straight away, I've said there's the four dimensions, then there's the six components, then it depends on the jurisdiction, then it depends on the commodity, then it depends on the industry. So it's very, very much like hitting a moving target to try to understand what they want. But what they want is what they want now, and it's immediate. So there's a there's a two speed issue, and I think that goes back to Julie's earlier point that um, you know regulation is regulation is regulation. Um, whilst we're being asked to be agile and anticipatory and adaptive, to change it, we have to go through two houses of parliament. So at a time when the world is going really, really fast, we've, we've got the slowest um, box compared to our policy colleagues or compared to our service delivery colleagues. So that's an additional challenge that I think we face. Um, that would be my, my open, opening statement. Yeah, look, thanks. Thanks for that, Grant. I think it's really... Um... You know that 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 matrix that you've done, or that two by two that you've laid out for us, I think is is incredibly valuable actually. Um, and we we should actually make sure that we share some um, you know, like a, almost like a picture of that kind of post mm -hmm. the the webinar because it's it's that piece about what is the role that you are playing and where is the voice that you are coming from. And I suppose what we are finding um that's a really critical question in the work that we're doing as a ministry to actually ask. And to be clear about, because otherwise, then you will put in solutions or you will respond inappropriately. Um, and what we find in our early work is you can't underestimate um, in terms of that working agilely. First of all, figuring out whereabouts are you working and what are you actually responding to. So, um, you know, that's what we're finding on a day to day basis is a really important part of our thinking. And we need to continue to you know, ask those questions in terms of and do that analysis. Um, you know, Julie, any any thoughts from yourself in terms of what you are hearing from people who maybe not immediately in the system, but you know, the stakeholders or wider community, and um, that we haven't covered. I mean, the the kind of way I'm interacting with this is I do a little bit of a bit of involvement with colleagues in Southeast Asia, and these are kind of officials at at government level, and even through the OECD. What one thing I notice is a lot of people are really a lot of um. ASEAN countries are very interested in how to use the tools of good regulatory practice. So things like regulatory impact analysis, 
the kind of public consultation in order to um, deal with the issues of, around the environment. You know, how can you use those tools to kind of create regulation which achieves those those um, environmental environmental outcomes? And I think um, that this is kind of a, the thing about actually the policy and operations side of you know of of our regulatory systems need to be kind of working together and making use of the tools at the design stage to do the analysis around the impacts of different options. The consultation as part of that is where you would pick up the views of all of the people that, you know, Grant was talking about, all the different players in the system, including yeah. potentially people outside of your jurisdiction. And so I think that's that's where I see a lot of interest um, in, in some of the interactions I have about how we can design our regulation to meet these objectives. And I think it's a very particular focus, but I think the tools are quite adaptive to be able to help help with that. It's just, it comes back to that capacity issue of the policy people and the regulatory people actually having the capability and the capacity to actually take those those challenges on, I guess. Yeah, yeah. Oh, thanks for that, Julie. That's, um, that's really helpful. Um, Lawrence, any comments that you'd want to make on the kind of conversation we've been having? Um, yeah, I also had the pleasure of hearing the minister uh, yesterday morning, and I thought it was really interesting as he talked about the work of the of the ministry. And uh, in particular, what struck me is, you know, talking about uh, sector reviews. And if I remember correctly, you said you were doing in one on early childhood education and another in horticulture, and that you were looking for what you might be announcing in the very near future, a third, if I remember correctly. Mm -hmm. And that I think that that that's important because. Um, the challenge for Vice President Dombrovskis will be where do you start? 70 years of laws. I mean, we've been doing this for a long time, but this is yet a new focus on uh, where to where to improve the regulation, because I tend not to like this phrase red tape reduction. Um, uh, and, and where do you start? And that's about the quality of your stakeholder consultation. So I think Grant's picture is really helpful. Um, and when you're doing it for 450 million people, that's a huge challenge. You're obviously going to need you know, uh, digital tools and a huge processing capacity as well. So, um, but you've got to start somewhere and you want to start where it matters most to people and where there's a real problem. So um, I think I found it really interesting that those were the two areas and maybe you could comment on, on, on how you got to that choice and how you think that process of prioritization will go forward because I think that's key because the resources are uh, never commensurate to the size of the problem basically so you've got to make choices yeah and uh, look I mean I think um the one thing I would say to that is we are not the only people in the regulatory system that are looking at you know as as Grant said the stock of regulation the flow of regulation and the effectiveness um and so actually where we make our choices is also about where other people are working so if we look at MB I mean, there's areas that MB are, are, are working on already that there's no value in the Ministry for Regulation doubling up on that work with limited resources. I think the other uh, point I'll make as well is, you know, what matters most to people? Actually, we have looked at that question a little bit and, you you know, but what matters most to people is not something you can answer because what matters really to me isn't the same as what matters to you. So I think you have to have a cohort of people that you are going to help that it will matter to, but whether that cohort is 5,000, 15,000 or 150,000, um, the important thing is, is that you've got a genuine, well-defined problem that you feel that you can um, do the research and actually make some effective changes. Um, so you know, we've gone through quite a, a, an extensive exercise, kind of desktop exercise of where the economic opportunities would be, where other people are working. You know, we've got a, a a kind of long list um but the other piece is you know you do have to push on an open door you know so i might think a, a regulatory design is poor and requires change and we should work there but if if you know that the resistance is going to be high you may go somewhere where you know that the regulatory design is slightly less poor but actually the people want your help in terms of changing it so the chances of you actually doing something and delivering something better for the regulated party and and the sector um, would be helpful. So it it's um, it will be, uh, I think, evolving. Uh, but it's really important to note we are not the only people 
in the government system trying to improve regulation um, and actually you know there's some great work happening in other agencies as well and you know um, shout out to MB who've actually in the absence of a ministry for regulation have really stepped up over the years in terms of particularly that regulatory stewardship role. Um, I'm just conscious that we have quite a few questions actually and um, I thought we might um, get um, get into some of those and then we can maybe come back. So we've got somebody, Grant, who's keen to understand more about the ex UK experience with cooperative based regulation and um, what you think might be some thoughts as to whether and how New Zealand should lean into that a bit more or where you see it happening in New Zealand and what your views are. I'm just going to find my my notes from my last conference because I've, I've typed them out and so I don't want to mis, misquote myself. Um, yeah, so really uh, outcomes based cooperative regulation. Uh, it comes out of some research that Professor Chris Hodges did from uh, Oxford University in the UK and uh, I was really, really drawn to to Chris's research because for too long regulators have quite correctly been concerned with regulatory capture, like getting too close to those that they regulate. Whereas what Chris really flips the mirror to that and says, well, hang on, um, we're regulators, we're meant to intervene. Um, we can intervene better if we know more, we can do that if we're closer to them, et cetera, et cetera. So it's basically leaning into our regulatory professionalism, trusting ourselves, but as part of that, um, we have to establish that trust, which is usually missing. It's usually too adversarial and combative between the regulator and the regulated. So it's really, really working on, on that trust. Um, and, but then going beyond that and proving and demonstrating meaningful trust from both sides, um, then the way they do that is they do a lot of regulatory sandboxing, to try some experiments to see how, how that would actually work in, in reality. Um, and just keeping an eye on the desired outcomes and performance, um, but also to your earlier point, Gronya, um, identifying harms and quickly taking action on them to protect, like remembering the core function why that regulation came into to, to being. But on that point, again, because we have lots of questions and we don't have a lot of time, um, I spoke to your people this morning, Gronya, um, about there's an article, a, you know, a couple of page article that Chris has written. I can equally give them the link to go on to, to any sort of material that goes out afterwards. So, but that's the general gist. It's moving away from the command and control prescriptive, punitive approach to regulation to being more open and trustworthy from both sides. Um, but yeah, I'll, I'll, I'll put the link um, or make the link available. Yeah, look, thanks for that, Grant. Um, another question, I think, um, Lawrence, we're good to get your view on this um, because you know what the the it's the the question is engaging is good, but entities and nations have limited capacity to respond. So how do you strike the right balance between giving everybody the opportunity to engage and getting things done? And um, you know. We, well, I, for example, you know, live in New Zealand and, you know, I, I face that challenge, but you're working in an area where you've got 27 countries where, you know, you're trying to strike that balance. So um, what have you found that is, is something, some things that we need to keep in mind in terms of getting that balance right in terms of engagement versus getting things done? Um, I think um, Public consultation in the modern democracy is absolutely essential, and um, it's a challenge at the level of 450 million. Um, digital tools are indispensable for doing it for, on that kind of scale, uh, and actually, with the uh, you know high degree of digital literacy we now have, which we wouldn't have had 20 years ago, um, it's opened up to really new possibilities. Um, I imagine, I don't think we're quite there yet, but I imagine AI could bring us quite a lot uh, in terms of the how you process the uh, the results, because that's a major challenge. You can open it up and get lots of opinions, and then how on earth do you process all the opinions you've got? That's actually, I've been involved in public consultations uh, on, on legislation, and, uh, you know, I think, oh, fantastic, we've got all this input, and then you think, oh, my goodness, we've got a really short deadline to try and to, and then we've got to try and somehow address all of this stuff, which we can only use tiny parts of at the end of the day. So it, it is it is a challenge. I think, nonetheless, it's, it's you're professionalizing that process, being clear. Of, I, li I like the diagram. I think you've got to be clear and honest about who you're asking and what you're asking them on and what you're going to do with it. You shouldn't over 
promise what you're going to say. You're not going to say, I'm going to totally change my proposal from your input. You say, we'd like to hear from you. And then we're going to, and then we're going to go forward. So I think you have to, um, it's kind of consultation usually to inform, uh, not necessarily to adjust. And I think we have to be kind of honest about that because um, there's often a plan, um, but the input can make a difference. And, you know, you, you, you need that input. Otherwise you make worse regulation. So um, I think uh, one really simple but important point is um, in my 30 year career, all policymakers start with good intentions. We're actually trying to do good law. Um, that's quite important. And so getting that input is a valuable contribution to making it better law. Um, but I think it's really important that the public is still, we were always trying to do our best. Then some of it's out of date. So instead of red tape reduction, I, I much prefer language about modernization. Um, you know, the world's changed. We need to update laws. That's normal. That's a part of democratic process. It's, it's a good that it's done democratically. So, um, and that consultation is a crucial part of reassuring the public that we're listening. Yeah, no, I think, yeah. I can I just jump in on that very, very quickly because we're having the violent agreement, I think, because sometimes when we talk about red tape, it then gets bundled in with not being fit for purpose. And it's almost framed as though it's a pejorative, but it was fit for purpose and it was set up for that reason then, but things have changed. So I think instead of throwing it out as red tape and bringing something new in, it's more sort of evolution, iteration instead of revolution. So couldn't, couldn't agree more, Lawrence. Mm. Um, well, the next question we've got is quite a, a technical question and seems to be quite popular with the audience. So um, do you think the, precaution, the precautionary principle leads to increased or more stringent regulation? So um don't know. I think maybe I'll throw that one to you, Grant, in the first instance, and then oh, maybe Julie. Thank you very much. Yeah, <laughs> yeah no problem. <laughs> so the precautionary principle is, is really about um, in the absence of full information, you know, shall we shall we do something? So we tend to see the precautionary principle a lot in environmental regulation. You know, these things take decades or centuries to get data. We 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 need to do something. I think it can lead to increased regulation, but equally that's because we're following that and another question talking about principles based, because you can't it's very hard to be prescriptive um, with the precautionary principle because the data is unknown. So I think they come together. The precautionary principle can lead to more regulation. It can lead to more complex regulation, but it's probably necessary because it's important. Um, so we, we can't reduce and simplify everything for convenience. Some things are challenging, they're important, and we need to uh, you know, consider them seriously. That'd be my, my starter for five, Julia. Now, pass to you and give you the hard bit. Well, I might actually um, pass to Lawrence because I guess from my perspective, the precautionary principle is something that's uh, core to the way the EU um, approaches its um, is one part of its approach to regulation. So maybe Lawrence might be the best placed to um, to respond to that question. Sorry, Lawrence. Um, great. That, that that was like the end of the rugby line. Um, um, <laughs> uh, okay. Um, I. Uh, I'm going to build on what Grant said. I think that, you know, um, you can't wait to get perfect information. It's not going to happen. So um, I don't think, I mean, I, I would argue um, that the AI Act is a, an interesting example because that's, we all have a sense that we needed to regulate in this space. It's fraught with complexity, um, but we, you know, um, we, we've had a stab at it after an extensive process. And, um, uh, and I, I think that um, I, I'm not claiming I'm an expert on what exactly the precautionary principle is, um, uh, uh, but if I've understood it correctly, this idea that you, you know, um, you, you kind of have to get going with what you do know and um, consult on what you can and, 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 and try and put in the best, um, best law available. And then it... it, it the nature of democracy is that very rapidly we'll have to update the AI Act. I'm fairly confident. I mean, you know, we've started in a place. There'll be rapid. There will be others coming fast. Um, they're looking very carefully at how it works, and then eventually we will, in the not too distant future, I predict, because the technology is moving incredibly fast, we'll have to update that. I would suspect, but at least we've made a start. Can I just come in on that because I, I had a question I was going to ask for. Something I was going to throw to Lawrence before, and I think it comes back now. So um, quite often people talk about 
best practice. And I find that a little bit challenging. Um, I, I prefer the term better practice. So better practice, you know, tomorrow than you had today. Because if you go best practice, gold standard, that's not always achievable for every country. It's not always achievable for every agency. And sometimes it's it's seen as too far down the road and they give up. So I think there's a little bit of a conversation with the with the work that the ministry does. And it goes back to an earlier comment that you were saying, Ron, you're about where you invest your time. I think it's a bit of a T-shape. I think the ministry would be best served to, to work on those sort of horizontal issues that are of relevance to all regulators, because as soon as you start going down into the specifics, um, the line agencies will have more experience and more, more knowledge. So they'd be reducing returns for the work of the ministry. But equally, with a little bit of horizontal and vertical, you'll also see some clusters. And that's where I think the ministry will have a speed dating role to sort of say, well, we don't know this, um, but we can, we can provide the sandwiches and the coffee. You, you work it out because it's important that you three or four regulators improve in that area. And then if we can remine it and see if there's anything which is scalable up to the to the horizontal again. So yeah, so just sort of connecting those two thoughts and scribblings from my notes. Can I jump in because I, I, I agree with that, I even go further. And I think something the minister talked about um, yesterday is also we've, you know, um, nobody ever talks about failure. Nobody wants to fail. But by definition, if you're trying to improve something, something must have be perceived to have gone wrong or gone out of date. And I wonder if we shouldn't be, you know, also to avoid this phrase, I, I detest of red tape reduction. Um, we should explain why we're updating something and what's changed as to the why. I think that's quite important. I'm a why person. So there's always a reason you do something. And of course, when you look at 27, even if we politely never say it, that that. <laughs> They're not all equally good practice. And we learn arguably more from those that are not the best than those that are the better. Uh, um, so, I mean, more honest relationships of why and it's, it, public's pretty smart. You know, if you say, look, the reason we're updating this is because AI is super new technology and we need a rule because it's, you know, and I think people get that. And I think um, but being a little bit more candid in why we're updating things is is honest and good yeah no, thanks so i think a couple of really important things there you know um the it, it's the context in which you're having the conversation as you say and if you want to improve systems um you know people respond to working on the strengths what works well what do we need to do differently why do we need to do differently as opposed to um you know the sky is falling in um julie there's been a few questions just on the digital side and and um just in terms of what you are seeing in terms of the design of regulation for digital systems. And also, what are you hearing in terms of your travels, in terms of how regulators are looking at um, you know, things like disinformation, um, how they're looking at, um, you know, there, there is, a, there is a, a narrative at the moment that we are maybe, you know, at risk of less social cohesion in certain countries and across kind of global nations. So, um, what are you kind of hearing and seeing in your travels, both in terms of digital systems and some of that kind of disinformation and how that's contributing to that wider community and wider society? Um, I'm not sure that I'm kind of probably hearing the best the best um, intelligence on some of this stuff. What I, I kind of there, I think there are two, you know, schools of of thought that there's a kind of the how we regulate the digital environment, which I think is quite a challenging thing. And I guess, you know, the U EU's approach to AI is kind of a part of that picture. But there's also a lot of interest, certainly in amongst ASEAN um, colleagues around how to use digital tools to improve the way you the way you regulate as a, you know, to make it um, easier for businesses to interface with you. And I think next week, there's a meeting I'm going to where there's where there's a session on using you know digital tools and and actually New Zealand I guess is quite a has is a good news story on some of that stuff you know the New Zealand business number and the biz.gov.nz some there are some things that we do that are quite good but I think it's interesting in in ASEAN I, I what I find interesting is for countries whose systems are you might say less mature than ours. They haven't been doing, you know, some of this stuff as long as us. They're they're very eager and keen to to try new things, and they're using, you know, tools to to kind of 
um, get public input into their development processes using a lot more di digital tools than probably we do. They're also, you're just trying to work out how they can do things smarter. And in a sense, there's a, there's a real um, chance that they will be able to leapfrog all of the um, the stuff that we've been wading through trying to work out how to do well that they can learn from the rest of us and um, I think potentially become leaders so I guess what I'd be saying is we probably need to keep an eye on some of our um, friends countries and friends who are developing at a faster rate than probably we are and are not burdened with all I mean we've got sort of the shackles of of the sort of years of experience that we're trying to morph whereas they can come with a slightly cleaner a slate. So I, I see some um, openness to really innovative thinking, and maybe we can actually learn things from some of these other 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 countries about how we could use digital tools better to regulate. But also, um, maybe they'll have some interesting ideas that we can put alongside the EU's approach to regulating AI, and maybe we can all come to a a really good model which is quite agile and adaptive. But just on that, what I would say, Gronya, is exchange is not robbery. All right. So, um, and again, I've got to be careful because I work all around the world, but I work with a client that's really, really good at the tech, really, really good at the tech, but is asking another country, how do, how do we interview people? How do we do the stuff that we used to do? Whereas that other, that other country is really good at the old school stuff, but not at the tech. So the former relied too much on the tech. And when the tech shuts down, breaks down, or is being upgraded, they 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 don't know the basics. So I think there's a bit of a, a, a trade off there about yeah, learn from people what works for us, what we need to adapt slightly. But yeah, so I just think there's that AI, digital, all good, but fundamentally, regulation is a contact sport in that we're talking to real humans and we're getting their experiences, and we need to be able to articulate and explain that. And sometimes an app um, isn't going to be the answer. Mm. Can I jump in with a couple of thoughts? Um, one is I mean, what you need in the in the increasingly digital world that we're finding across the EU. I think there's two at least two major challenges: digital literacy. The good news is that that's massively improved, uh, much faster than I think people thought. There's obviously a generational dimension to it potentially, but not only. Um, An access in some countries, there's an access to the technology question um that that's one the second one which we we you know uh, our dreadful experience of this awful war in ukraine has shown um is is cyber security is absolutely indispensable and um you know we're going to need to do an awful lot more in that space um because um everything is going digital but you then need really 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 protected systems on the contact sport with humans just one area we haven't mentioned today where i intuitively feel the european union and new zealand are, are quite close in approach and it is a question of approach is data protection where there's quite different views out there globally. And that's one of the rare areas I would say where, um, uh, you know, cause usually things gravitate towards to borrow grants for his better practice here. It's really a, almost a culture uh, approach and we stick very strongly to the EU approach. We believe in it and it's really important to, to our identity. And I'd be interested for any thoughts on that. And um, thanks for that. Um, just conscious that we are starting to uh, move towards uh, towards the end of just um so what i thought we'd do we do have a couple of other questions that i think i there's one that quite a was quite popular about the ministry for regulation being charged with making rules easier to navigate um what does success look like i think what grant said earlier is part of success it's actually getting people in a room it's not having the answer it's facilitating other answers it's helping regulators be agile it's helping lawmakers policy makers think about asking all the right questions. Um, you know, it is about doing the work that we do in the um, sector reviews. But as I said before, we're not the only people in the system. It's actually making sure that we are leaning into others, learning from elsewhere. I see ourselves being a, you know, a facilitator, supporter, provider of guidance and information. And look, you know, what success people say you made a difference. You know, might not have made a difference everywhere, but you made a difference in let's say the early childhood sector and actually you helped us be better regulators or you helped us do this. Um, yeah, I think there's, there's a lot, um, a lot uh, to be 
I mean, what I what I think is great is the focus of the ministry. It, it has given the opportunity for a number of conversations that I don't think would have happened elsewhere. It'll actually be the people outside the ministry who use those conversations to make a difference, and that will be part of success too. Um, we do have a few other questions. What I'll do is um, we will make sure that we get answers to those people and may well be offline, but I thought it might be useful. We've got a few minutes left just to maybe hear some uh, closing thoughts from each of our panellists. Um, and then um, we'll close with a karakia. So in terms of closing thoughts, in terms of emerging trends, what you've heard here today, um, um, I'm going to get you to start off Grant, apologies. So um, any kind of closing thoughts from you? Yeah, look, I would say just sort of re reinforcing some of the points that I've made in my interventions so far today, encourage um, you all to work across the entire regulatory system or ecosystem. Um, ensure that regulatory policy and regulatory operations are connected in a meaningful way. Sp uh, pay special attention to regulatory practice and regulatory delivery. And then finally, I know it's about innovation and emerging trends, but please get the basics right. You know, we crawl before we walk, before we run. We will be much better placed to embrace innovations and emerging trends if we're coming from a solid base. So. Final comment would be get the basics right in terms of your regulatory practice. Thanks for that. Lawrence, some thoughts from yourself, and then we'll go to Julie. Well, first of all, thank you very much for this opportunity. Extremely interesting exchange. I can just confirm that it's as hot an issue in the European Union as it is here in New Zealand. And with that thought, I would just like to suggest, uh, uh, Gronje, that we, we look at what conversations might be useful and interesting uh, also linking up with which parts of the European Union system that would be helpful, because I think that we would really benefit from listening to your experience and hopefully some of the exchange would be interesting for you. Pick yeah. a topic. I think AI is probably an obvious one. Maybe climate's another area, um, um, arguably more controversial, but that uh, whatever you would be interested in, I would be delighted to try and facilitate a, 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 another such exchange with some EU partners. Thank you. Thanks very much, Lawrence. Julie? Um Coming back to sort of Grant's point, I mean, I think that one of the big issues, and I think stewardship is designed to to help to try to address this, what should help is is the policy ops um, parts of the system not talking properly to each other. I think that's a a fundamental that we need to improve on. But I would also come back to, I guess the the thing that I'm always focused on and trying to promote is. We need to, be, as part of our DNA, we need to be thinking about how our system is influenced or affected by things outside the domestic territory of New Zealand, you know, for, for a variety of reasons. And it's not to say we can't do it uniquely in New Zealand things. We need to understand the implications of doing that. And we, we need to be very focused on that. And I do, we do have a toolkit that we've put up. Um, an MB toolkit that's available that I might send a link to be put online to just help people think about the sorts of things you could be doing. It doesn't all doesn't have to be harmonization. It can be quite soft engagement. Um, and I think you know Lawrence's offer to open a dialogue is you know on key issues, that's a really useful way for us to understand what's going on elsewhere in the world and to get some good ideas for how we could improve the design of our own of our own system. So I think that's a really, positive thing we should be all focused on doing where we can. Mm. Yeah, look, look, thanks for that. I mean, I think the conversation has been incredibly rich. I'm not going to do it justice, but I would like to kind of try and summarize some of the things that we've we've heard today. I think that um, the fact that regulation is all around us, regulation is important, regulation keeps us safe, there is a reason for it. I think, you know, Grant, what you said is there's the stock of regulation, you've got to make sure you've got a good stock. Um, and, you know, you've got to stop what stock is, is not good, you've got to have a process uh, to manage that, you have to be agile. Um, you know, you've got that kind of flow. Um, you've also got the operational effectiveness and capable link capacity. And I think earlier, Grant, you talked about capable link capacity. Um, and, you know, what I'm finding, and it's very early days of the ministry, you know, we're, we're kind of nine months old. But um, one of the messages that's coming through from us and the work that we're doing already, we're hearing from people, it is... I'm going to rift off a Banana Rama song that some of you might be old enough to remember. 
you know, it is what you do and the way that you do it. So I, you know, actually what you do is important, but the way that you do it is really important too. And I think that capability, capacity, uh, the delivery of how you monitor, manage, um, have that continuous closed loop, um, you know, system um, is really important and is continuing to emerge as, as a theme um, in terms of actually, because as you said, Grant, changing some of the design parameters, you know, needs to go through two houses mm -hmm. in Australia and um, you know, it takes time in New Zealand. So if you want to make sure that you're being agile, make sure you're pulling all the right levers and you're pulling them proportionally. And actually design is not the only lever, um, you know, how you deliver it as a lever as well. Um, I think, you know, Julie, what we've, we've heard from you and also from Lawrence is you know, New Zealand is a, a, a you know, we are we are part of a global community and we are a trader. Um, you know, we will uh very, very important part of you know how we maintain our society and how we ensure that we create, you know, jobs, opportunities, um, safety and well being for people. And we can't do that without thinking about the international implications of any decisions that we make. Um I also um, liked, you know, agility is important, um, but actually, how do we make ourselves agile? We partly make ourselves agile by being really clear. Where are we working? Why are we doing it? Who are we uh, working with? In what capacity? Um, so that we're actually answering the right questions and asking the right questions and then coming up with, you know, appropriate and proportional solutions. Um, yeah, there's so much to be learned, as you said, Julie, from countries that actually on the surface look um, as if they're not as well advanced in their thinking, but often that means they're unencumbered. Um, and if we look at some of those ASEAN countries and actually Estonia, the digital success of Estonia is because they, sorry, people sometimes say it's they, you know, they started with a much cleaner slate. They didn't have the legacy. Um, and sometimes we need to step back and say, well, you know, that's the legacy, but actually can we, you know, challenge the thinking in terms of the legacy. Um, so look, hugely, hugely rich conversation um, and so pleased that you could all join us. Um, uh, thank you very, very much. Thank you to everybody who joined us. We were up to about 160 people at our peak, which is wonderful. This will also be made available um, online. And so I'll just once again say a huge thank you to Grant, Lawrence and Julie um, and the team who pulled this together. And if I just close with a short parakia. Unahia, unahia, unahia kiti urutapanui, kiawatia, te mama, te nako, te tinana, te waru, iti ara takata, koyara, irongu, pakaria, aki kirunga, kiatina, tina, huie, taikie. Dora, everybody, thank you very much. Mm -hmm.